Yang Ahmad Berhormat, the Chief Minister, Mr Lim Guan Eng. Yang Ahmad Berhormat, the Deputy Chief Minister, Mr Manso Osman. Esteemed members of the State Legislature. Dedicated members of the Board of the Penang Institute. Distinguished guests. And my lucky Penang fellow residents. I am very grateful to you for coming here on a Saturday morning to inspect the draft report of the Penang paradigm. My colleagues and I look forward to receiving your guidance on what we have prepared and we are very eager to make it a much better product. Today, I pick three things from the Penang Paradigm Report to share with you. Ah, sorry. As you could see, I reflect my age, at, but not the age I live in. Okay, the three things I would like to share with you are first, my assess the assessment of the Penang Institute on the economic situation we have in Malaysia and on the various federal government's programs on uh, the economy, society, and the environment. What you will hear of the economic situation is our conclusion that Penang and Malaysia has been economically stagnant for the last 15 years, despite what you have heard in, news, in our good news media. For example, yesterday we were told that the economic growth rate has jumped from 5.2% in the previous quarter to 6.4% in the last quarter. And about a week ago, Minister Noor Yaakob said that we would achieve developed country status before 2020. I hate to prick the bubble and to tell you that all is not well in Bole land. The second thing that I would like to share with you about is our diagnosis on what's been holding us and the third part of my speech is the operational component of the Penang Paradigm Report. The sum of the specific programs that we are proposing to the state government and to the people of Penang to consider adopting for the next 10 years. Now, when I said that Malaysia has been in economic stagnation for the last 15 years, despite the fact that we know that income growth rate has been growing for the last 10 years, roughly 4.5% a year. That is not zero. The first thing to remember is, before the Asian financial crisis, for those, the previous 10 years before then, we are growing around 9.5% a year. So we already have slowed down. And when we talk about catching up to developed country status, we must keep in mind that the developed countries are not staying still. They themselves are growing. What is relevant is not reaching a particular level of income. What is relevant is we reduce the gap between ourselves and the highest standard living that is attainable in the world. In other words, if you talk about reaching a particular level of income, then we are, have already greatly exceeded the, the income at the time of the Industrial Revolution. In that sense, we have reached the, the stage of development. What we need is to focus on the gap between us and what is achievable. Specifically, let's think about uh, some of our neighbours who we can all agree 
are catching up to first world status. I'm going to compare ourselves to Taiwan and South Korea. In the case of uh, Taiwan, as you could see, in 1963, when Malaysia was founded, Taiwan was only at 12.6% of U.S. income level. Before the Asian financial crisis, Taiwan had reached 55.7%. And before the global financial crisis, Taiwan had reached 66.8%. In the case of Korea, it started off even worse, 10.7%. It reached 14.9% before the Asian financial crisis and 61.4% before the global financial crisis. In the case of Malaysia, we started off at 13.6% of U.S. income level. We were richer than both Taiwan and Korea. We make progress up to 96. As you could see, that we were at 30.7%. Yes, we grew slower than Taiwan and Korea, but we make progress nevertheless. But look at where we are in 2007. 31.9% of U.S. level. Back 10 years ago, we were at 30.7% of U.S. level. Basically, we have closed the gap by only one percentage points. Whereas, if you look at Taiwan, they went up by 11 percentage points. In the case of Korea, they went up by, over, by almost 20 percentage points. This is what I mean when I say we have been in a period of economic stagnation for the last 15 years. Because 13.7 to 31.9 is not progress to be proud of. This, what I have told you, is at odds with the impression you get from our good news papers in Malaysia. We are told of progress. But clearly, the government doesn't believe the good news paper that they hold. Because the government has been implementing a series of expensive programs uh, to deal with, to improve the economy. Let me mention four of the more well-known programs that the federal government have enacted. The first one is Talent Corps. The second one is, for us in Penang, is well known, the Northern Corridor Economic Region Development Plan. And there are similar plans for the eastern states on the peninsula, and there is a plan for, South, for Johor, the Iskanda project. And we also, the latest is the Economic Transformation Plan, and then more recently, the Government Transformation Plan. What do the existence of these programs reveal to us? Clearly, there is a need for a talent core uh, program only because there's a great shortage of human talents in Malaysia. That is becoming a bottleneck in production and preventing us from going up the value-added ladder. And the second thing is, why do we come up with the idea of the Northern Corridor development, the Eastern Mal Malaya development zone, and the Southern Malaya development zone. It is because Malaysia's pattern of economic development is geographically extremely unequal. We have great wealth in the Klang Valley, and everybody else is quite a distance behind. Basically, we have a case of extreme wealth with surrounded by areas of economic stagnation. And then the economic transformation plan. The goal is to raise the level of investments in Malaysia. And why do we need to raise it? Because it has fallen to very low levels. If you look at private investment defined as FDI, investment by state-linked companies, what I call truly domestic private investment, what you, would find, oh, what you would find 
is that it is now half of a sh as a share of GDP. The present value today is half of that value in the early 1990s. The reason why we have been growing so slowly, why the growth rate has fallen by half, is because the investment rate has been fallen has fallen by half. And of course, the third, the last thing, the fact that there's a need for a government restoration uh, reformation program has to do with a deterioration in the performance of our gov institutions of governance. For example, around 10 years ago, uh, this, our highest court under Tun Yusuf Chin made it easier for people to engage in the sale of stolen property. That was something new, but that was not something that was correct. So, given this string of uh, institutional malperformance, to coin a new word, we, there is an, even the government feels that it has to do something about itself. Let us think, with all these new programs that have come out, the situation has yet to be reversed. If the medicine doesn't work, what should a good doctor do? One is, clearly, I have not given enough medicine. I should double the dosage, scale up. That's one way. Or the other way is to think of the possibility that maybe this is the, not the right medicine. Let us ask, how were these programs uh, designed? They are surprisingly de designed without first telling us what has been making the patient sick. In other words, there's no identification of what are the specific factors that have caused us to stagnate. Basically, the reason why these programs have not worked and will not work is that they are focusing on the symptoms and not on the root causes on what's wrong. For example, if a patient were to come to you and say, I have this terrible headache. Well, without seeing the patient, you know, because I'm talking to the person on the phone, I would say, take aspirin and call me in the morning if you're not better. And next morning I get the call, I still have a terrible headache. And I would say, well, maybe you're thinking a little too hard about your love, your really loved one, perhaps you should take a cold shower. Right? The list goes on. But if I had a chance to look at the patient, I would say, hey, why don't you stop beating yourself on the head? You'll feel a lot better. In other words, a lot of the reasons why Malaysia economy is sick is because of self-inflicted wounds. Specifically, we can see what the following sequence. The government acts, the rest of society reacts, and then we get an outcome. We have, for example, under the Mahathir years, a tightening of race-based social economic policies. For example, uh, there is promotion is based more on your relationship with the appropriate people than on your performance. And given this lack of uh, meritocracy and lack of opportunities given to the able, we are not surprised, therefore, that uh, many of our best and brightest have left the country. And that's why we have a shortage of human talent. So, if we stop driving them out in the first place, we don't need to go and ask for them to come back. And they will only come back if we stop doing what that has been driving them out in the first place. And, thank you. and the second self-inflicted wound that we know is that the government punishes you for doing well. For example, if you are a small, medium enterprise and you want to expand, 
the natural way of expanding is to raise funds in the stock market. But a condition for raising funds in the stock market is that you have to ha now hand over 12.5% of the equities of your company to uh, investors approved by the government. You just cannot sell your shares to any Bumi Butres. In fact, it would have to be approved by the government. So, I said 12.5%. The number before 2010 was 30%. If you list your company to raise funds, you lose 30% of your company. So given this high tax on growth, what is the natural consequence? People leave the, its capital runs out of the country. As we know, Malaysia has the second largest capital, fl capital flight after China. And on a per capita basis, of course, we are greatly surpassed China in terms of the money that has rushed out. And the other consequence is that small, medium enterprises that could grow, but they refuse to lose control of their firms by handing over 30%, and now it's 12.5%, so they choose not to grow. That means they have cut back on domestic investment, and this is why we have a great shortage in domestic investment. One may ask, given that the rate has been reduced from 30% to 12.5%, wouldn't that make things better? That is fooling yourself. Do you know why? Where else in the world do they collect 12.5% or higher in terms of uh, transfer of equities to investors approved by the state? As long as it is greater than zero, 12.5% is still an inhibiting factor for people to expand the uh, size of their operations. Look at the number of small medium enterprises that have emerged from being import competitors to being world-class exporters. You cannot find too many examples of that in Malaysia as compared to Taiwan. In Malaysia, small medium firms don't grow up. They don't grow up because you get punished if you grow up. So what happens to the ones that really want to grow? They leave the country. Shangri-La is now a Hong Kong listed company. Many of our big companies of potential do not want to pay that tax on growth, and the result is we leave uh, capital, we have capital flight. The third thing I want to talk about is about the over-centralization of power at the federal level. Look at the rapid Penang bar system. The entire operations is run from Putrajaya. What the routing would be, where to put the bus stops, and all of this was done even before Google Earth came to existence, and the Putrajaya bureaucrats know where they should put the bus stops. This over-centralization also, also means that not only that most of the income is kept by the central government, more importantly, the state, unlike at in, at during independence in 1957, are no longer allowed to borrow money to build local infrastructure to enable economic growth. For example, when New York City wants to enlarge the bus station, Port Authority, what New York City does is that Port Authority goes out on the open market and borrow money to expand the facility. And, and the fees it collects on the operation of the facilities goes to service the loan. In Malaysia, the states are not allowed to do that. So the state cannot supply the, the hardware infrastructure. And even if the state can afford to do so, for example, we have asked for the runway to be extended for the last 20 years. In the last 20 years, the government has built two runways longer than that of in Penang, one in KLIA and the other one in Pulau Langkawi. Even if the state will pay for the extension, it still needs the permission of the federal government to build the extension. Basically, the federal government has complete control over what 
the kind of infrastructure that the state is able to provide. The over-centralization cannot be better seen by the fact that where are most of the universities in Malaysia located? They are all in the Klang Valley. Penang is the second largest city, and we have got one, universe, one and a half university, because Wawasan is a part-time university. And then, when you look, if you count the numbers in Kuala Lumpur, that is quite incredible. If you look anywhere else in the world, let us look at the United States. Boston has as much universities as the New York area, and certainly much more around the Washington, D.C. area. We have over concentration. That is why we needed the Northern Corridor Economic Region. The government realized that you've got this pocket of prosperity surrounded by areas of economic stagnation. And the last thing I want to talk about is that because of the, there has been a growing lack of transparency in the operations of the federal government. The most well-known one would, would, of course, be like uh, negotiated tenders for government projects instead of open tender. This opaqueness was justified in the past in that we, in 1957, you could say, since you are a pretty uneducated country, even if I tell you, you wouldn't understand. So let us save time. I don't tell you, and you don't need to pretend to understand. But Malaysia has come a long way since 1957. Man, most of us can now, at least everyone here in this room, can read a balance sheet and be able to know about the, the the situation in the rest of the world and able to do a comparison. By keeping everything so non-transparent, you have removed the ability of the public to monitor the performance of the government. And naturally, we got a decline in uh, the performance of the governance institutions. On that note, how should we think about the government transformation program? How has it worked in practice? Uh, our esteemed former chief minister, uh, Kosu Kun, has devised a set of KPIs for each ministry, key performance index. And then that would be a measure, to, that would be an incentive to have every ministry up its uh, performance in order to have a respectable KPI. And we just, with a KPI, we introduced the KPI criteria without doing anything about the existing level of over-centralization, the existing opaqueness of government operations. Would KPI work? As someone who has taught for many years, if everyone in my class fails, that shows I'm a lousy teacher. If every ministry shows a low KPI, then, then we ha have lousy leaders. So what do we do? Clearly, one way is to change the criteria that ensure that we all surely meet it, or we fake the numbers so that we all look well. Basically, if the KPIs do not improve, things will be done to adjust such that everybody still look good. After all, this is not without precedent here in this country. During my times, it is very, very difficult to get six A's in your Form 5 exam. Now, we have people getting 12 A's, and the number of get people getting 12 A's is increasing every year. This great Mass, this great improvement in brain power in Malaysia, however, is contradicted by, the, by international comparison of math and science scores across countries. What we find is that the average 15-year-old in Malaysia has the math and science ability of a 12-year-old in the rest of the world. So, when you talk about KPI, 
who designs the KPI. If it is the government itself that designs the KPI, you can rest assured everybody will come up smelling like roses rather than what they really ought to be. So let me talk about having identified these root causes. On one, the shortage of of uh, human talent, the shortage, the shortfall in investment, the geographically unequal distribution of development, and the substandard soft infrastructure supplied by the government. Therefore, it is quite disheartening that in recent period, a number of art organizations have come up with recipes to cure the Malaysian disease. The surprising thing about all of these other proposals is that they are diagnosis free. They don't tell you what's wrong with it. It's like it's, they tell you, we will make you rich and we will give you the following, do the following things for you. It's like take the aspirin, take the cold shower. But unless we know what is it that's ailing us, we cannot solve the problem. Now, I talk about stagnation the last 15 years. So the previous periods, you were doing well. So why, but all these policies I talk about has been in existence at, in the beginning of the Mahathir years. So why was he able to do so well? The reason is that we have not seen the negative effects of the brain drain, the capital flight, the insufficient physical infrastructure, and the poor government uh, performance before 2000 is because we have been very lucky. Before the year 2000, we have had received a very large proportion of FD foreign direct invest of global foreign direct investment. In other words, as domestic money runs out, foreign money flows in and more than compensate for it. As domestic engineers leave, foreign, the, the MNCs bring in their own engineers to, to supervise their operations. So, the result is, Penang grew. And that is why FDI has become so important to Penang. We don't depend on our own people to invest. It is largely because federal policy has been driving our own people out. Then, the other big thing was, we discovered oil around 1974, and thanks to the inflow, the government is able to take big, massive infrastructure projects, especially in the Klang Valley. We built a Bumidaya complex, we built the Petronas Twin Towers, Putrajaya, KLIA, and more importantly, we are able to finance our government-linked companies to undertake massive investment. So together with the FDI, we have federal budget uh, investment, we have had a uh, GLC investment. But all of this changed around 2000. In uh, May 2000, when China agreed to join the WTO, most multinational corporations realized I could not help but to reflect the country that I'm living in. <laughs> I have <swear. clears throat> But as you see, I recover social Malaysia with the right policies. <clears throat> Let me get back to this. Because of the spreading of globalization, most, a, a large part of the global investment that used to come to Penang now flows to the rest of the world. Like India, which used to be fervently anti-FDI because of the all, India was ruled by a multinational corporation, the East India Company, for over 100 years. I can understand why India hated uh, foreign direct investment. Even India opens up its arms to foreign direct investments. So what used to flow into Malaysia now flows elsewhere. And in the same time, 
after so many years of mismanagement, the GLCs do not have the financial resources to invest the way they did before. And the result is investment has plummeted and the growth rate has fallen. So along with that, we now also realize that uh, our income inequality now is rapidly rising and there has been very, very substantial loss in biodiversity because of the failure of the federal government to enact existing laws to protect our forests and lakes. Now, let's get to the, the choice that we face. The choice is really, we reform the policies that are making Malaysia sick, or we continue the federal government strategy, and now the Karakan strategy, of introducing a new set of policies to offset the ill effects of the existing policies. Should we take more aspirins and cold showers instead of stop beating ourselves on the head? We are, in short, at a turning point. We have a choice of either building upon what that has been done in the last four years. In the last four years, the state government has been attempting to neutralize the negative effects of federal policy. The first neutralization would be to replace crony capitalism with fair competition. For example, the simple act of having government projects being given out on an open tender basis. Another one is the, the, the state government has engaged in very ingenious ways to supply more infrastructure like roads and other facilities. And the third is that the government itself tries to perform better by putting on itself the burden of proof of that it is doing better. How? It, it, two things. It has adopted the CAT principles of governance, where our state government operations are much more transparent, and to prevent uh, misbehavior, all members of the EXCO de declare their asset positions. So these acts of transparency and and the improvements in good governance are what that has been done in the last four years. The Penang paradigm attempts to build on it by presenting a coherent program of action. Clearly, to, the first thing we need to do is to revive economic dynamism in Penang. The, o the only way to become richer is that uh, you become more productive, or you produce things that have higher value. Basically, we need to have new engines of growth. And the role, and since the engines of growth to be sustainable and to be efficient, they have to be private sector engines of growth. And the role of the state is to act as a catalyst to induce the private sector to perform and to regulate the private sector to make sure that the collective good is taken care of. Well, some of the new things we need to do is certainly we've got to go high-tech, both in manufacturing and in bio-agro industries. The second one is we need to have the growth of high-value services. For example, Penang is fast become, is without the help of the uh, earlier state governments, has become a more important regional medical center. It's been growing at least 15% a year. Basically, we are the place where middle-class Indonesians, middle-class in, uh, Thais in southern Thailand, come when they 
need medical attention. And clearly, we should seek to regain our position as the international part for the very simple reason that we take into account the trends that are happening in this part of the world. Northern Sumatra, Southern Thailand and Myanmar will grow significantly in the next 10 years. And what ports were they use before they grew? They used to use the Penang port. So it is quite natural, therefore, that Penang will be their port of choice to use in the future. Many people will say, thank you. Many people will say that's the wrong thing to do to be an international port because look, the Sumatrans will build their own port, the Southern Thais will build their own port, and the Burmese will build their own ports. To say that is not to know the history of Singapore. Malaysia and Indonesia, what do you think they have been doing for the last 30 years? What is, why is Port Pelapas in existence? That's all to steal business from Singapore. All these people try and they have failed. Sometimes when you do not have the natural geographical advantages to do so, man-made efforts will not succeed. Give you another example. What, is, what was the International Financial Center in East Asia before World War II? The big financial center before World War II in East Asia was Shanghai. And ever since the Tokyo, and then after the war, Shanghai was closed off to the rest of the world, and the International Financial Center disappeared from East Asia. Japan has been trying since 1965 to become the, an international financial center, and yet it has not succeeded. And every expectation is that with the deregulation in, going on in China, Shanghai will re-emerge to be. Why? Because there are certain natural advantages to it, just like Penang. So that is why I'm confident to say we should be pushing for an international, to become an international part and not get ourselves to playing feeder role to Port Clang. Thank you. We welcome foreign direct investment, but at the same time, we should not neglect our own. A key role is we want our small, medium enterprises to grow in the world-class exporters. In the last four years, the state government has started the SME Center, SME Innovation Center, and SME Villages to try to help the SMEs on a whole, uh, on, a, on a comprehensive front to be able to upgrade themselves and to get financing to expand. All of these efforts are valiant and are effective, but are not 100% effective, largely because we still have the date weight of 12.5% confiscation of equities when you try to grow. And let us note that each of the new growth engine has the prerequisite for it is not just good infrastructure by the state, good regulations by the state, but also that ultimately you need talent in each of these sphere of activities. You cannot replace human talent or human capital with financial capital or just equipment. Basically, human talent is the most important catalyst role that the state government can play. The catalyst role is to increase the supply of human talent. The obvious ways are one, you train more of them. Number two, you keep what you have, you hold on to what you have. Number three, whoever, whatever talents that still remain in Malaysia, we want them to come to Penang instead of staying in the other states. This is unfortunately a zero-sum game. We will take it from them. And what are some of the things we could do? Of, obviously, there are, the Penang paradigm has many specific suggestions. Let me highlight some of the more, some of the less mentioned ones. What is the best way to train a labor force? 
the best way to train a labor force is to have each family having the resources to send their children to get the education that will enable them to reach their maximum intellectual potential. In other words, enable the people to get the education that they want. So wiping out poverty has to be a, very, a fundamental move. And the state government has wiped out absolute poverty in the state of Penang and now moving on to the next stage, which is getting rid of uh, poverty. Retaining human talent and attracting human talent. Well, we have got a whole host of policies, but fundamentally, how can we make somebody move from the Klang Valley to Penang? One way is to double the salary, which is very difficult, because my folks at the Penang Institute are working for half the pay of what they used to get paid when they were at the Klang Valley. And why are they here? Part of it is because Penang is a nice place to be for them and their family. And the way to retain and to attract is to continue to improve the livability and sustainability of Penang and to entrench social harmony and widen social inclusion. We do this, the last two steps, not because we, for the talents we want to attract and to retain, but because this would directly raise the welfare of all residents in Penang. In other words, we make it more livable and more socially harmonious for ourselves. And it has got the fortunate effect of being able to attract other talents to come here, here with us. Now when we talk about oops, <clears throat> uh, I make the mistake of uh, falling into the mode of talking too long. So there was the part where I was going to give you very specific suggestion of suggestions in the Penang paradigm on how we would enhance livability and uh, sustainability. Clearly, one of the f there are four, at least four important things. We've got a, whole, a longer list. One is to make housing affordable for all. And how would one make housing affordable for all? Our expert, Stuart McDonald, uh, can, can, write, can tell you a book uh, about it, but I will select two simple measures that we all are aware of. For example, what is in greatest shortage? It is housing for the middle classes and the lower class. The most severe shortage is housing for the middle classes. So what we want is developers to build fewer large luxury apartments and more affordable middle class apartments. Here we have two things that we can do. One is right now, when the developer is developing a certain footage, he pays a development fee for each apartment that he brings into existence. But that makes no but what it means is he has no incentive to have more to, to build a large number of units. The more units he built for the given footage, the more development fees he has to pay because it's development fee per unit. So we should certainly reform it to the development fee is a function of how big the apartment is so that it is not dependent on the number of units. So that is one way to increase the, the incentive for them to uh, increase supply of middle class housing. Another one, right now, in order to have affordable housing, most developers, when they put up a high-value development, they have to construct a certain number of low-cost housing. We ought to replace that system because you can almost see what is the incentive for the developer in the low-cost housing. He'll use, try to use the 
you know, the cheapest material that meets standard, and the other one is put it in the cheapest part of the state. You know, if he could do it, he'll put it under the ditch because that was the cheapest place you, 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 you could buy. What could be put in place instead is re remove that requirement that he supplies low-cost housing and ask for a fee instead. And that fee would depend, would be a progressive uh, rate depending on the footage of each apartment that he produced on the market. And with the fees, the state can build low-cost housing uh, with, via the open tender system. So that would, number one, increase low-cost housing and increase housing for the middle class. I know that my folks are giving me the signal, I have to go. We clearly need to reduce traffic congestion. There are several things. One has to clearly be, we've got to promote mixed land use so that people work, play, and sleep in, in locations closer to each other. And we cannot hide the fact we need more roads. For example, for someone to go from Patu Tanjung Bunga to uh, Penang Airport, he would first have to go to the Bagan Jerma, turn, turn round about, go to Western Road, and then to Green Lane. We should, buy part, we should stop making him come to town and then get out of town. We should build strategic bypasses that will make north-south flow of traffic better. We need more roads. But that is not the most, that is only one important point. Because the key is to move people, not cars. We have to uh, put in place a comprehensive mass transit system of trams and buses. And I think right now, Penang is very well linked, is going to be very well linked to Sabrang Pride on the southern side. I think that we should go ahead with the link connecting the northern part of the island to the northern part of Sabrang Pride. The reason is quite simple. We may have second-class citizenship in Malaysia, but we shouldn't have a second-class district in Penang. By building a third link, it will accelerate the development of Sabarang Pride. We will be able to bring Sabarang Pride up to the standard of living that is on the island. That is what a third link would help promote. So, for equity, that is something we need to think about. Uh, well, we, I was going to talk about what we could do to enhance the natural environment and also to increase the, the quantity and quality of public space. I will cut short it largely because all the suggestions are down there in the exhibition. The next thing is to accelerate social development and inclusion. We've got to combat uh, poverty, we've got to combat uh, discrimination, and when we talk about discrimination, we should think about it in broader terms. Like, for example, the physically disabled in Penang are disabled, are, are discriminated against because it's very hard for them to move around the island. Many of the sidewalks are not accessible to the disabled. So the state government should put, should put in regulations and supply infrastructure to enable the disa physically disabled to be able a full part of life in Penang. Democratic empowerment, we suggest that this declaration of assets not be, be extended from members of the EXCO to all members of the Penang legislature. That is democratic empowerment. And we also think that we need to bring back the city councils. We need to bring back local elections so that people are directly accountable for their local actions. There are other facts, things that we do, but let me get to a more important point. I have outlined many programs. The natural question is, who's going to pay for that? That's what, the, according to the Inter Economics Intelligence Unit, clearly the federal government is the only one that can pay for it. So that's why the federal government is the only one capable of supplying what that is needed to move the country ahead. And what is the claim of the Karakan program is that, of course, if you are elected, we would get the money. Why? Because we are proven friends of 
the friend of of Amno. It is true that Karakan is a proven friend of Amno, but the question is, is Amno a proven friend of Karakan for the last 15 years? Is it a case of unrequited love? Zhe zhuo duo qing, or a case of jinta da verbalas? So this hope that the federal government would all of a sudden change its behavior of long time and now start becoming more generous to Penang is a case of hope triumphing over experience. I end by, say, by reminding you that with the Penang paradigm, it's just like opening a betel nut. In within it, fragrance and all the magical properties that Penang is famous for. We will, with the implementation of the Penang paradigm, become a society that would be intellectually creative, socially progressive, culturally vibrant, politically empowered, environmentally sustainable, and materially prosperous. Thank you. Like my predecessor, the one who just spoke in front of me, I end this with a, with a request to you. He asked indirectly for your vote. I ask directly for your brain. I would like you to go through the exhibit, and if you are too busy, go do it online. And write us, tell us where we at the Penang Institute could make this report more useful to you. We want to be an example to Malaysia so that we can convince whichever federal government that happens to be in power to also adopt the Penang paradigm so that this will be an intelligent and international country to accompany an international and intelligent Penang. Thank you.